Hello, and welcome to Ideas Having Sex with Chris Kaufman. I'm Chris Kaufman, and each show I bring to you an interesting and provocative scholar to discuss topics in social science, philosophy, history, politics, and more. If you enjoy what I do, please take a minute to subscribe to the show and to give us a rating and review wherever you listen. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Ideas Having Sex. I'm Chris Kaufman, and today I am joined by lawyer and U.S. foreign policy scholar Sean Mirsky, and we are discussing his new book, We May Dominate the World, Ambition, Anxiety, and the Rise of the American Colossus. Sean, thank you so much for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here. So this book is largely a history of U.S. foreign policy in the Western Hemisphere, from the time of the Civil War, roughly, to the time of World War II, which is an underknown era of U.S. foreign policy. Why is this era and why is this subject important? The question that ultimately led me to write this book was uh, perhaps oddly uh, the question of China today in the 21st century. And I think the 21st century's trillion dollar question is going to be whether China rises peacefully or whether it rises aggressively. Because if it rises peacefully, the future looks very different than a world in which China acts like other rising powers have acted in the past. And That's, I think, part of the problem, that the historical record suggests that rising powers do tend to be aggressive and expansionist when they rise, uh, by which I mean they tend to pick fights with other great powers, they tend to meddle in the affairs of their neighbors, and in general, they try to dominate greater and greater slices of the world. And I thought it would be useful to sort of reflect on China's path and what may determine the course it takes by looking at the example of another uh, rising power, um, the United States, and to see first uh, to what extent did the United States follow the sort of classic rising power model, and second, and in some ways more importantly, why did it follow that model? And so, and I thought the United States would be a good case study for a number of different reasons, but one of them was frankly uh, the sort of values that Americans have had, I think, uh, since the founding, where the country really, I think, adopted a a perspective that was, you know, by just the circumstances of its birth, uh, anti-colonial, pro-sovereignty, pro-liberal, classical liberal values, um, and and anti-interventionist in a lot of different ways. Um, And this, of course, was most famously sort of encapsulated in uh, John Quincy Adams's uh, July 4th speech in 1821, where he basically says, you know, that the United States is the well-wisher to democracy and freedom abroad, but she goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. And uh, John Quincy Adams basically uh, made the point that up until that moment, the United States had never once interfered in the sovereignty of any other nation. And setting aside whether that is precisely true, it certainly wasn't true 100 years later, because uh, when the United States did rise, it uh, it went on what I call in the book a regional rampage. Uh, and uh, the, the heart of this period was uh, from 1898 to roughly 1918. And during that two-decade period, the United States was intervening in its neighbors just at an absolutely unprecedented rate, uh, either before or since, using force, uh, I think, an average of almost three times a year against uh, its neighbors. And so... The book, in many ways, was an effort to tell that story, to explain why the United States did all that, uh, and to do so in a way that helps us sort of reflect on not only China today, but other great powers today and the United States today in terms of what uh, the future may hold for their foreign policy. So the background of all of this intervention is the Monroe Doctrine. In some ways, you could say this is also a, a history of the Monroe Doctrine. What is the Monroe Doctrine and what was the motivation for that policy? So the Monroe Doctrine <clears throat> was uh, declared by President James Monroe uh, exactly 200 years ago on December, I believe, 2nd, uh, 1823. And it was a response to the uh, previous decade where Latin American countries, uh, which up until that point had been colonies of Spain and Portugal, had uh, essentially thrown off their colonial shackles and gained independence uh, in you know, essentially a decade-long uh, series of revolutionary wars. And from the United States, this was a massive uh, sea change in its strategic position. Uh, Before, it had been essentially one of, I think, two independent nations in the Western Hemisphere. The other was Haiti. And the United States was otherwise surrounded by the colonies of great powers, uh, great powers that were hostile to it as a matter of ideology, and great powers that were much, much stronger than it as a a military matter. And so for the United States, its early decades as a country was precarious in part because of this strategic position. But when Latin America gained its independence, it 
opened the door to the United States to a world in which the United States essentially shoved the other European great powers off of the Western, off the continent, out of the Western Hemisphere, and led to uh, an entire half of the world in which the United States was essentially unchallengeable by any other power militarily. And for obvious reasons, that was a very attractive vision uh, for the for the young nation. But it was also one that was certainly not uh, foreordained. And uh, in particular, in the early 1820s, there was a gathering movement in Europe that made it seem to many American statesmen like European powers, the monarchical powers, would soon cross the ocean and recolonize much of Latin America. And uh, the, the culmination of this tension was the Monroe Doctrine, in which President James Monroe essentially declared uh, to Europe that there would be a giant keep out sign in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, that the United States promised that it would not interfere in European politics. Uh, it also promised, less convincingly, that it would not seek to eliminate uh, European uh, colonies that were still left in the Western Hemisphere. But the United States basically forbade Europe from at any point creating new colonies in the Western Hemisphere or in any way trying to control, uh, I think it was the destinies of Latin American countries in the Western Hemisphere. And so uh, in a lot of ways, the Monroe Doctrine was this uh, assertion that the uh, Western Hemisphere would be the exclusive province, not so much of the United States as you know a kind of dominating power, but the exclusive province of uh, the countries of the Western Hemisphere, and that Europe really had no right to sort of intervene in it or to in any way try and call, recolonize it uh, in a way that the United States thought would be uh, dangerous to its national security. You mentioned that the Monroe Doctrine was in part a response to the previous decades when Spain and Portugal dominated much of Latin America, and then they leave. So now the U.S. wants to have this area for itself. What specifically motivated that concern? Were there actual, rather than, you know, perceived or hypothetical, were there actual problems that the U.S. really had with Spain and Portugal as great powers dominating South America? So the concern on the uh, on the part of American statesmen was not really about Spain and Portugal themselves. Uh, Portugal, of course, was not really a great power at that point. I think Spain, even arguably by that point, was no longer a great power. The concern instead was that Spain and Portugal, as they had in fact demonstrated, uh, could not really hold on to their Latin American colonies. And so the risk was less that they themselves would reconquer them and more that other powers that were much more of a threat to the United States would. And so uh, Great Britain end up, ended up sort of siding with the Monroe Doctrine, but it was always a kind of the the bogeyman in early uh, American statesmen's imagination. But there were concerns also about uh, powers like Austria and Prussia and Russia, which at that point had formed something called the Holy Alliance, uh, which, among other things, was basically a, a military alliance that was dedicated to banishing the specter of democracy and republicanism from Europe and from the world. And so this was very much a, a coalition of powers that was, I would say, antithetical to everything that the United States itself stood for, uh, and that, uh, and to everything that the new Latin American nations uh, stood for as well. And so uh, it was those great powers, along with France, that uh, ended up sort of being the the concern from the perspective of the United States, rather than Spain and Portugal themselves. So going forward, the U.S. in your story is very concerned with the problem of order in the Western Hemisphere. So I wonder if one, you could talk about what that is. And is that a term that was coined by an American statesman at some point? Or is that like a term of art in modern international relations? No, it is my very clumsy attempt to describe uh, what the underlying strategic problem was. But um, basically, the United States, uh, the Monroe Doctrine established what I think was true, and I think American statesmen rightly understood was true, which is that the United States is safer in a world in which hostile uh, or rival great powers don't have massive military presences in or near its borders. And from the United States perspective, that meant that uh, most of its neighborhood, but particularly the countries in Central America and the Caribbean, should not be colonies of Euro European powers and in general should not be under the thumb of European powers. And so part one of the problem of order is basically this understanding that the United States' neighborhood is strategically important to it, which, again, not, not particularly surprising. Part two is that, uh, unfortunately, much of that neighborhood was itself quite uh, disorderly and unstable. And I, I think sometimes, you know, in the modern day, uh, people like to say that it's you know, that the United States shouldn't necessarily judge the way that other uh, countries, you know, run their governments and the way they frame things. And I think that's 
that that critique certainly has a has a point. But the kind of uh, disorder that we're talking about in this era is not that these countries near the United States weren't living up to its high standard for what a you know republic should look like, but that they were in fact essentially failing or failed states. They you know had presidents that changed with the season. They had racked up massive bills to foreign banks. They uh, oftentimes uh, had revolution, just nonstop civil war and revolution. And in general, they were incredibly internally divided, both politically. Uh, well, politically, and then uh, enthrall economically to European banks and European states. And from the United States' perspective, that disorder in its neighborhood presented a vulnerability, not just to the countries in question, but also to the United States itself, because it ended up being a power vacuum that European powers could fill. And I'll give a concrete example of this in a moment. Um, and then the last aspect of the problem of order was that the United States thought that there was a real threat from these European powers. And so when you combine these three things together, uh, areas of the world that are strategically important, that are politically and economically disorderly, and that are under foreign threat, the result is that you have uh, essentially an intolerable problem that if you can do something about it, you will. And so uh, one good example of this uh, comes in the occurs during the Civil War, when the European powers, and particularly France, take advantage of the United States's distraction and its internal divisions uh, to occupy and uh, to invade and occupy all of Mexico. And so France sends a massive military expedition across the Atlantic Ocean. It marches its forces into Mexico City, overthrows the government of Juarez, and takes over the country with many tens of thousands of crack French soldiers. And from the United States perspective, this is obviously like a massive liability. I mean, even during the Civil War, there was a very real risk that the, Fran uh, that the French, who were sympathetic to the South during the Civil War, would link up with Confederate forces at the Rio Grande and uh, essentially give them aid and resources to continue fighting their uh, war against the North. And so from the Union's perspective, this is, of course, a major strategic liability. But from the American perspective, it is, in fact, just a, a bad thing to have a uh, the world's foremost military power suddenly, you know, plop down uh, on right next to your border. And much of what drove France into Mexico was the fact that Mexico was in many ways the sort of platonic ideal of what a disorderly state in this area looked like at the time. Uh, since its independence, Mexico had gone through dozens of different governments, dozens of different presidents. It was essentially in one long nonstop civil war and revolution. Um, Juarez himself had come to power only after a very uh, particularly bloody uh, war that lasted several years. And the French realized that first, this constant war gave uh, them numerous opportunities to sort of divide and conquer because, of course, different factions of Mexicans were either for or against uh, the French invasion. And uh, it also gave the uh, French an, uh, an excuse to go in because the Mexicans owed them tremendous amounts of money, not only in terms of loans that they had defaulted on, but in terms of uh, claims uh, that the French had ranked, racked up as a result of uh, harm that had been inflicted on French citizens or uh, on French property in Mexico. And so it was this sort of perfect storm where, Mex uh, where France took advantage of Mexico's weakness to expand its influence. And the lesson that Americans drew from that was that going forward, any sort of instability or any sort of vulnerability in any aspect of the hemisphere was a vulnerability uh, for the United States itself because it was an entry point for the sort of European uh, great powers that the United States was trying so hard to keep out from the hemisphere. And the book in many ways tells the story of how this particular problem ended up driving so much of American foreign policy towards the region, which at a sort of high level was designed to strengthen and stabilize its neighbors in ways that would allow them to better resist any encroachments by Europe. But uh, as I'm sure we'll discuss in a sec, in practice, that's not quite the way it worked out uh, on the ground. I understand that the U.S., did not have a you know large scale or open intervention to oust Napoleon III and France from Mexico, but they did have some more you know hidden programs or or covert operations of you mentioned like just losing giant piles of guns, leaving them unattended, where maybe the the Mexican Republican forces could find them. How important really do you think the U.S. was in ousting France from Mexico? Was it was it a crucial factor or was it just one of many little little things. I, I would say it's something between the two. Um, my guess is that the Mexicans would have eventually kicked the French out regardless of the United States' aid, um, in large part because the Mexicans had clearly never reconciled themselves to the French occupation, and in part because uh, 
the politics of Europe at the moment was uh, Germany was rising, it was consolidating its rise as sort of a nation state. And so that would eventually lead to the, you know, Franco-Prussian War, and, and it would lead to um, Germany uh, essentially um, beating France and Napoleon III falling to, uh, from power. And so part of Napoleon's motivation in exiting uh, Mexico when he did in 1867 was to bring troops back to face the German threat. And so I think those two factors in combination probably would have been enough at some point. But there's no doubt, I think, that the uh, United States very much accelerated the uh, the French withdrawal. All of the relevant participants essentially said as much. Uh, uh, Emperor Napoleon III never openly admitted that that's why he'd withdrawn. But you can tell from just the way he was handling his uh, diplomacy and what he said privately that he was primarily concerned about the risk of war with the United States. Um, Juarez himself said that once the United States started supporting his forces, it was at that point a done deal that the French would, French would lose. And the uh, the Austrian puppet emperor, Emperor Maximilian, that the French put on the throne of Montezuma, um, also primarily blamed the United States for his his eventual uh, down downfall and execution. So, and it really is hard, I think, to overstate the degree to which the United States did help Mexican forces in terms of uh, providing arms and, and occasionally even just openly participating in the conflict against France. You know, there are uh, anecdotal reports before the U.S. really got involved that the Mexicans were like, training in some places with bows and arrows, you know, against French forces. And so uh, once the Union won the Civil War, um, it had massive surpluses of, you know, state of the art uh, weaponry that at that point, as you said, it started leaving, you know, unguarded near uh, Far East camps in Texas, uh, and being, you know, shocked, shocked to find them uh, missing the next morning. So I think the the United States did, I think, make a, a pretty material difference, but probably not one that, uh, in the in the long run, I think it would have ended up probably in the same place. Hey everyone, this is Chris Kaufman, and I just wanted to take a break to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for listening to these episodes and giving me the opportunity to speak with people I admire and read amazing books every week, every other week, whatever. If you are interested in helping this little engine that could of a show grow, uh, please just recommend it to a friend. Recommend it to a friend. Maybe give it a give it a five-star rating on one of those places you listen to it at. But really, if you just recommend it to someone, that, that goes a long way um, for a small show like this. So thank you again. Thank you for listening. Keep listening. And back to the show. Let's talk about a different intervention in this period. So one of your chapter titles is taken from an essay or a lecture by William Graham Sumner, The Conquest of the United States by Spain. So for our audience at home, they might be wondering, Spain never did conquer the United States. And in fact, they lost the Spanish-American War. So what is this uh, title supposed to mean? Yeah, so um, the the relevant chapter is the chapter on the Spanish-American War, and I think this, the Spanish-American War has always fascinated historians because it has this sort of strange paradox at the heart of it. The United States enters the war uh, essentially to free Cuba. Cuba at that point had been in a th uh, two, three-year-long revolution against Spanish control. It was one of the few Spanish colonies left in the Western Hemisphere. And the Spanish had been uh, putting down the Cuban rebellion with just absolutely brutal uh, force. And, you know, the numbers that the United, that Americans were hearing at that point, which were, I think, not far off from the reality, were something like one fifth, one sixth of all uh, Cubans had been killed by Spanish forces. The, I mean, just the humanitarian disaster is really hard to overstate. And so the United States enters this war quite openly to free Cuba. It passes this resolution as it's going into the war, saying that once the war is over, it promises to give Cuba its independence. And the, the entire war is framed, I think, in the American uh, imagination at the time and since as this sort of anti-colonial war, this war for, you know, all the values that America holds dear. And yet, at the end of the war, uh, the United States ends up annexing the Philippines, turning the Philippines into its colony, and then engaging in a really brutal counterinsurgency against the Filipinos who are trying to gain their independence in a way that seems remarkably similar to the way that the Spanish have been crushing the Cuban insurgency only a few years prior. On top of that, despite promising to give uh, Cubans their independence, the um, the United States ends up foisting something called the Platt Amendment on the Cubans, which... Uh, among other things, gives the United States the right to intervene militarily in Cuba uh, whenever certain uh, conditions are met. And so the the puzzle of the war and, and the thing that William Sumner was uh, pointing at was the United States starts this war for sort of anti-colonial, you know, beneficent purposes and ends up looking a lot like Spain. 
for so for him it was the sort of yes the united states had beaten spain militarily but spain seemed to have sort of conquered the united states in terms of its values and the way it behaved and the united states had become a great power at the end of the war but it had also started acting like the traditional great powers of europe why did the us want so badly to build and monopolize a canal across Central America, what became Panama, but it was not a foregone conclusion that it would always be Panama. Why was that so important? I mean, statesmen had for like hundreds of years, including in Europe, been dreaming of a canal, uh, in part because short of a canal in Central America, there's no real place where it's easy for uh, someone on the uh, eastern side of the Western Hemisphere to get to the Western side. Um, and if you're on the East Coast of the United States, for instance, usually the way you would get down to the West Coast, at least if you wanted to do it in one unbroken journey, is you would have to steam all the way down south to the very southern tip of South America, around the uh, coast there, and then steam all the way up the entire coast of South America to get to the West Coast. And as you can imagine, this journey uh, took an incredibly long time the other shortcuts involved a railroad across Panama, uh, but that itself was a very dangerous journey. Many people died on it. And so uh, from the United States perspective and from the perspective, frankly, of everyone, there's a real need to have a canal somewhere through Central America that would cut short that journey and make uh, the movement of trade, goods, uh, people much easier. So the economic imperative was always there. I mean, for European powers, for the United States, for Latin American countries themselves. There was also, however, a military component to this, which is after the United States, you know, filled out the continent and essentially gained the West Coast, it needed a navy to protect not only the East Coast, but also the West Coast. The problem was that it was very difficult for the navy to get from the East Coast to the West Coast in anything approaching a reasonable time. And there was this moment during the Spanish-American War, or at the lead up to the Spanish-American War, I should say, where this became really just very obvious. There was a, a major warship, one of the best warships in the U.S. Navy that was, I think, based in Washington State and then I think California uh, at the start of the war. And they realized that, of course, the war was going to be taking place in the Caribbean around Cuba. And so they ordered the ship to get to the Caribbean. But it, this took three months, right? And so in a crisis, there was this concern that you can't just have the Navy on one side of the ocean and learn that you later need to have it on the other. And so the canal was a way of allowing the United States essentially to consolidate its uh, naval forces uh, into one Navy that it could then sort of rotate from ocean to ocean as needed through the canal. So far in just the conversation we've had, we've had a concern from France coming into Mexico, a concern from Spain. There's also ongoing and rising concerns from Germany and Japan. This is a decent amount before World War II. This isn't Nazi Germany. Hirohito wouldn't have been in power yet. But it's the same dynasty. What was the threat that they saw from Japan? Uh, was it only Hawaii, or were there other concerns that the U.S. had with Japan? So the United States' concern about uh, Japan was primarily about Hawaii at first. Um, and even, even that was, I think, fairly limited until 1895, when uh, Japan clobbers China in the Sino-Japanese War. And it becomes starts to become obvious to the world at large that Japan is itself now a great power. And for a variety of reasons, the United States becomes extremely concerned about Japanese intentions towards Hawaii, and in 1897, there's this massive crisis where the Japanese uh, dispatch one of their finest warships to Hawaii in, in ways that the United States was, I think, uh, probably rightly convinced might lead eventually to uh, Japan annexing the Hawaiian Islands. And so, and to be clear, this is prior to Hawaii being a U.S. territory, correct? Yes. Yeah, so at this, certainly prior to being a state, but even prior to yes, being a territory. Yeah. So this actually ends up being one of the. I argue in the book that this ends up being actually the kind of critical thing that pushes McKinley to try and annex Hawaii. It's in some sense a sort of preemptive step that if the United States is concerned that if the United that if the United States doesn't itself annex Hawaii, Japan will. And so um and so in 1897, that's when immediately after the wake of this crisis, um, or actually to end this crisis, the United States ends up signing the annexation treaty with Hawaii and then a year later annexing uh annexing the islands. And so at that point, I think, you know, the relationship with Japan, in some sense, the strategic importance of Hawaii was that it was so far out in the Pacific Ocean and so far divorced from anything else that once the United States claimed Hawaii, there wouldn't be any kind of continuing tension with Japan because 
Hawaii would in some sense act as the sort of outermost uh, bulwark against Japanese expansion and, you know, in a, in a, a way of protecting the West Coast. But two things uh, start to happen that I think lead to rising tensions with Japan. One is, as I mentioned before, the annexation of the Philippines at the end of the Spanish-American War, which of course makes the United States a Pacific power quite close to Japan. And Initially, there's some suggestion that the annexation of the Philippines is a good thing from the United States' strategic perspective, but it very rapidly becomes clear that it's just a major vulnerability because the United States really has very little ability to defend it in the event that uh, Japan would ever try and conquer it, which is, of course, what ends up happening in World War II. But then the other concern about Japan is uh, occurs in Latin America, and particularly in Mexico, where during the 1910s, the Japanese start becoming very involved um, economically, but also politically. And uh, in part because of the U.S. interventionist record, a lot of Latin American countries at this point start looking to outside powers for potential protection against the United States. And so there are very serious conversations that start occurring between, for instance, Mexican uh, political leaders and Japanese leaders about uh, Mexico potentially becoming uh, allied with Japan uh, against the United States. And none of this ends up going anywhere, in part because of the way that World War I plays out. But this was at least a sort of um, a subtle threat that was be, uh, rising in uh, prominence in, in kind of American statesmen's mind. Uh, are these the talks? Oh, oh, 1910s. OK, so these yeah, talks 1910s. are happening after uh, well after the U.S. annexes the Philippines. And my understanding is, is that the U.S.'s role in the Philippines is also starting to spark a lot of concerns in Japan about the U.S.'s role. So it's this is kind of a, a mutual threat, mutual fear of each other of two rising powers, essentially. Yes, and that's certainly also the case with uh, the United States' relationship with Germany, where um, you know both sides, I think, feel threatened by the way that the other one is acting and concerned that eventually it's going to lead to a conflict. And there's this sort of security dilemma dynamic that you know each one kind of feels like they have to move relatively aggressively in order to preempt whatever the other one is trying to do. So there are a whole bunch of other interventions and and. We are not going to be able to talk individually about all of them, but everyone should read the book. It's a really great book, and it's really well written. It's not dry at all. You're a great writer, very entertaining. I, Thank you. I, I'm wondering what regional countries in Latin America or the Caribbean managed throughout this whole period, or are there any, to completely avoid U.S. intervention? And if so, how did they do it? To step back, I think it, it might be helpful to sort of lay out what what ends up being the, the thesis of the book, which I, I mentioned earlier that the problem of order was this U.S. concern about instability in its neighborhood and that the U.S. foreign policy at the at a sort of a very high level was, well, if we just, can just strengthen and stabilize our neighbors, then they will become less of a uh, vulnerability uh, that might lead to the expansion of European influence. And so U.S. foreign policy is, in some sense, aimed at, I think, a, a relatively beneficent goal, which is, you know, helping its uh, neighbors, particularly the ones that are really war-torn and, revolu and rev uh, in the throes of revolution, to become stable politically, become stable economically. The problem is that the, the methods the United States uses to get there uh, end up becoming quite uh, aggressive and sort of offensive, uh, as I you know explain in the book. Um, the U.S. goes from trying to stabilize its neighbors through trade and diplomacy to eventually deciding that the only way it can do it is by declaring protectorates over them, uh, running their uh, internal uh, revenue streams by taking over their custom houses, and eventually by just occupying and, and running their governments entirely. And so this ends up going from, you know, sort of nation building through peaceful external indirect means to just direct nation building through force uh, in the way that we then end up trying to do again, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, a century later. So the question, your, your question about which countries in the region end up avoiding uh, U.S. intervention is essentially the countries that are relatively stable and uh, economically and politically. And so most of South, and it also, of course, just depends what you uh, mean by intervention, but I, I think I use it in the book to essentially mean the use or threat of use of military force to control the sort of internal sovereign affairs of a country. And so much of South America at this point is is relatively stable, is relatively strong. I mean, uh, Argentina, for instance, is is an ardent critic of the United States throughout most of this period, and it really vies with the United States for leadership of the Western Hemisphere. But the U.S. never really, until World War II, threatens military force against Argentina, in large part because it's a country that can hold its own against Europe, and there's not this real risk of uh, a European country coming in and colonizing Argentina. And similar things are true, uh, you know, for for most of this period, for most of South America, 
even in Central America, you can sort of find examples of countries that are not in the same sort of failed, failing state status as their neighbors. So Costa Rica is a great example where by no means do, does Costa Rica have a, a perfect government. There are certainly kind of real problems at this time, but it's not having a revolution every year. It's not constantly in civil war. And as a result, you don't see any sort of uh, as much of a concerted uh, U.S. effort to sort of intervene in Costa Rica. Guatemala is the same sort of case study, although, of course, we do end up militarily intervening there in the 1950s uh, uh, in response to the communist threat. But uh, but during this period, at least, uh, Guatemala and Costa Rica, I think, are relatively unscathed by American power compared to some of their neighbors. Are there similar concerns on the part of the United States of other regional powers pushing around their neighbors? I mean, is the U.S. worried that Argentina is trying to be a, a global, uh, re regional, not global? Um, is that a concern or is it just outside great powers? The answer is a little bit of both. Uh, the United States is concerned whenever any country in the Latin, in Latin America invades one of its neighbors or in any in any way sort of provokes a war, but not so much because it's worried that any country in the, in Latin America is going to become a serious rival. I mean, even Argentina, which I think at this point really was the sort of the other pole in the Western Hemisphere. There was never any serious question that Argentina could rival the United States just by virtue of size, resources, economy, military. It was just never really a close competition. And so, I mean, this is honestly part of the puzzle of U.S. foreign policy during this period. For the United States to achieve the sort of hegemony that it wanted, it didn't really need to bully any of its neighbors. It just needed to push Europe out because Europe was the only uh, European countries were the only real rivals to the United States. And so if you could just eliminate Europe, then at the end of the day, the United States would, by process of elimination alone, end up becoming the strongest country left in the Western Hemisphere. But, you know, as I said, part of the problem was that the that the threat from Latin America was less that it would grow too strong uh, and, and more that it would become too weak in a way that led uh, Europe to come in. This book was to some extent inspired by the question of what China's rise is going to look like. What lessons can other smaller, non-great power countries learn from countries in Latin America that managed to avoid the troubles caused by the US? I mean, I think you just said it. Focus on being stable and prosperous. Yeah, just things. the easy stuff, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is part of the challenge that in a large sense, it's not like these countries wanted to be, you know, constantly in, in civil war or revolution. So I, I don't know that that's a very actionable piece of advice for, <laughs> for small powers looking to avoid getting uh, invaded by by great powers. Um, I, I do think, you know, most of these countries understood that they were always walking a delicate line. I mean, sometimes I think there's this sort of stereotype that the United States uh, was overthrowing regimes that were anti-American. And that is just really not true. As I mentioned before, Argentina was like adamantly anti-American. And in fact, a, lot, a large number of Latin American countries were quite anti-American in their politics and rhetoric. And the United States really paid them no mind because rhetoric alone wasn't the problem. But I think the thing that, that really set the United States off, uh, and you see flavors of this in in during this period, although it also comes up in uh, other regions at other times, is when smaller powers uh, try to bring in rival great powers, try to ally with them. And so the, the U.S. reaction to the French occupation of Mexico was incredibly aggressive, uh, you know, in terms of, I mean, so much so that in 1864, while the Civil War is still going on, there are serious uh, policymakers at kind of the highest levels in both the North and the South who are actually arguing that the North and the South should put down their arms, declare, a, essentially pause the Civil War, send a joint expedition into Mexico to kick uh, the French forces out. And then at that point, they can resume the civil war or come to a negotiated settlement. I mean, and it sounds so fantastical to us, because of course, we all know and understand the civil war is this sort of like existential struggle for the future of the country. But it is just hard to overstate how strongly the United States felt about the French forces next door. And that is a continuing theme throughout um, much of the rest of American foreign policy. So part of what drives the United States into the First World War is uh, what some may remember from U.S. history class, the Zimmerman telegram. It's this very clumsy attempt by the German foreign secretary in the middle of World War I to propose a military alliance with Mexico against the United States. Mexico does not uh, accept this offer, but when the United States finds out about it, it goes understandably ballistic at the possibility that... Uh, you know, that Germany is essentially trying to ally with one of its neighbors against it. And so I one of the lessons, and this is sort of a, 
uh, a real politic lesson, but is that great powers don't react well to other great powers trying to enter their neighborhoods. And to the extent you are a small power in uh, one great power's neighborhood and you're trying to welcome other great powers in, let's say, as a counterbalance or as a uh, as someone to protect you from your uh, your bigger neighbor, you know, I think those smaller powers end up playing with fire. Uh, it's not to say that if you're a smaller power, you shouldn't do that. It's just that you have to understand there are real kind of consequences and you have to be very careful about it. So the threat uh, that motivated U.S. foreign policy in this era is essentially major power interventionism or imperialism. But can you be more specific than that about about the threat? Like, let's say, for instance, the U.S. Deci had decided to back off and not in play this game. And as a result, France ends up controlling Mexico and Cuba controls or Spain controls Cuba and the Philippines and Japan takes Hawaii and Germany annexes a bunch of South America and all of these great powers now have all this new land and imperial headaches. So what's the specific concern from there it, it, that they're going to invade and conquer the United States or is it something else? It's something else, at least in the first instance. Um, part of it is that the United States understood that by virtue of being an ocean away from all of the power politics of Europe, it never had to invest as much in its military and particularly its ground military, its army. Um, as European powers did. And in a way that I think made a, a really material difference to Amer uh, America's rate of economic growth. I mean, if you're Germany or you're France and you constantly have to worry about a massive military army on your border, you know, by the other power, you're always needing to invest in, in your army to kind of protect against that. And that ends up leading to a, a, a relatively massive expenditure of money um, that the United States was privileged enough not to have to spend. And so uh, so just in the first instance, I mean, the presence of European great powers and, and particularly European militaries in the Western Hemisphere would have been, I think, a really significant tax on American growth rates because the United States would have had to raise up and uh, sort of continue funding these these military establishments. Um, there were also kind of related, uh, I would say, ideological concerns that sort of the growth of a permanent military establishment, and in particular, a large army, would lead to changes in the American form of government itself, right? I mean, this is a concern that goes all the way back to, you know, the debates between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists during the founding of the country about how much do we really want to give the federal government the power to create a massive army? Because what does that mean in the long run for the sort of freedom and democracy of American? And so one of the arguments you heard a lot at this time is that the presence of European militaries in the Western Hemisphere in a permanent way would lead to the not only lead to the rise of large militaries, but also then end up potentially um, making the United States less democratic and potentially leading to, you know, a coup and and things like that. Um, admittedly, somewhat speculative. And I, I think that concern certainly resonates less among Americans today than it did probably a century ago and certainly less than it did two centuries ago. Um, but that was one of the frequent reasons. Um, but, you know, the 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 final, well, not the final, but one other piece of the puzzle is that Europe's rivalries, um, if you look at the major crises of the period, uh, let's say between 1870 and the start of World War I, most of the crises between European powers were not based on events that occurred in Europe. They were based on events that were occurring at the periphery of empire. So in Northern Africa, in, you know, in China and East Asia in general, and the concern for Americans was that if you have Europe uh, established in the Western Hemisphere, that these the sort of internal rivalries that the European powers had between themselves would eventually spill over and create a conflict in the Western Hemisphere that the United States would inevitably get dragged into. And so in concrete terms, let's say, you know, France occupies Mexico and let's say Great Britain takes much of, you know, Central America. And for whatever reason, the two of them get into a war. Of course, that war that's maybe occurring on the battlefields of Europe is also going to spill over into a war between the colonies that are still in the Western Hemisphere. And at that point, it becomes very, very difficult for the United States to avoid getting dragged in. Um, the United States, I think, understood this very well from its early history, where the Napoleonic Wars, despite U.S. best attempts, ended up dragging the United States into not one but two wars. First, with France, you know, in the uh, eighteen or sorry, 
1790s in the uh, quasi war, and then with Great Britain in the War of 1812. And so part of this was just basically the broader understanding that the, the United States, by keeping Europe away from the Western Hemisphere, could establish essentially a zone of peace, uh, a zone where there was relatively little um, need for massive military establishments, and a zone where um, you know trade could kind of prosper and the United States wouldn't have to worry about getting sucked into conflict with a major military rival. So I'm very sympathetic to a more non-interventionist foreign policy. And it seems like the U.S. has this mission to keep the Western Hemisphere free of great powers in these wars. And as a result, sometimes causes some of the problems that it's trying to solve. It doesn't mean that maybe it wasn't creating a better environment that would have happened hypothetically if, if it was filled with European powers. I'm not sure why it's obvious that the, the U.S.'s interventions were obviously to be preferred than Britain's interventions or something. So... Hypothetical question. To some extent, the Swiss Constitution was inspired by the American Constitution, and they tweaked it and arguably improved it. And uh, what if, counterfactually, after the Civil War, the US, there had been a sea change in popular and elite opinion, and they just decide we are going to go on a pretty strictly neutral footing. Our foreign policy is essentially neutrality, a kind of decentralized military that's not a standing army and just free trade unilaterally. What's likely going to go wrong with that? Or or would that have been ideal? Yeah, so it, it's a great question because, um, you know, one of the underlying themes of the book, I think, is that all these decisions have trade-offs, right? That there's never a clear kind of, this is the correct answer that does you know, that is free of consequences, that it really is just choosing the least bad of options. And, and so uh, I, I think... Because it's a hypothetical, there's necessarily going to be a little bit of speculation. But here's what I would say. So first, um, the background to this entire period, and part of the reason that the United States is so obsessed with the European threat to the Western Hemisphere, is because of what's happening in the rest of the world. And from 1870 to the 1870 to the start of World War One is a period called the uh, Second Age of Imperialism. And this is basically when European powers, and also to a certain extent, Japan and uh, the United States, although setting that aside for the moment, went on a kind of colonialist tear through the rest of the world, right? I mean, if you've ever heard of the scramble for Africa, this is when that occurred. Um, all of Africa, all of Asia, all of the Middle East, much of the Pacific was at this point colonized by the European powers. And the statistics end up being really shocking. I mean, from 1870 to 1900, uh, Great Britain, Germany, and France alone end up colonizing some 9 million square miles, which is twice the size of Europe itself. Um, and they already had pretty substantial colonial empires in, in Africa and Middle East and, and Asia. And you get to the point where by 1914, the figure is something like 85% of the world's landmass is under the control of colonial powers. You can literally count on one hand the number of exceptions in Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. I mean, it ends up being, I think, Ethiopia, Thailand, and Japan. And Japan, of course, itself is an exception only because it's a colonial power. Uh, and Ethiopia, of course, gets colonized by Italy uh, you know, a few decades later. And so it is not a happy record for the rest of the world in terms of escaping European colonialism. The conclusion, I, I think it's very difficult to avoid the conclusion that the reason the Western Hemisphere ended up escaping that and the reason that that 15% of the world's landmass that's not under the control of the European powers, that's the Western Hemisphere, right? And I think it's just hard to look at a before, you know, uh, before 1870 map and a map of the world in 1914 and not conclude that the United States had something to do with the fact that the Western Hemisphere ended up escaping European colonialism in the way it did. Now, that doesn't quite answer the question, though, of could the United States have achieved that objective without kind of going to the interventionist extent that it did? And it also doesn't answer the question of, well, how bad would the world have been if all of Latin America got colonized? I think for both of those questions, it it, it ends up becoming very hard to sort of give a concrete answer. I think if the Western Hemisphere gets colonized, as I mentioned before, I think there are kind of a mix of concerns that Americans had, some of which were maybe less valid, but some of which I think are you know, extremely valid. It would have been very difficult for the United States to get to avoid getting involved in World War One much earlier had uh, the conflict begun in the Western Hemisphere in 1914, the way it did in the rest of the world. Um, so that's one point. The second point is that um, 
the United States, I think, ended up having a relatively pro part of the reason that we are the global superpower that we are today is precisely the fact that we don't really face an enemy at our gates. There is no other great power in the Western Hemisphere that we have to worry about, and that allows us to send our military abroad and to essentially not have to worry about the consequences of doing so. Now, you can say that that has not been a good thing on the whole for the world. You could say that the world might be in a much better place, and even the United States might be in a much better place if the United States had not been sending its military forces abroad, you know, after World War War II with regularity. But I do think um, at minimum, for instance, during World War II, it, it's striking the extent to which World War II ended up destroying the economies uh, of essentially every other power because that's where the war was fought. Whereas the United States itself, you know, didn't really fight the, the war on its soil with the exception of the Philippines. And it ended up, uh, if anything, raising its standard of living during the conflict in part because it was fighting abroad. And so that sort of remoteness, its ability to sort of not have to fight things on its soil, not have to fight things near its borders, I think does end up becoming a relatively important factor in the in the United States' overall uh, power and status. Again, you could argue that that is maybe not what the United States ought to be prioritizing, but I think it's sort of hard to avoid the conclusion that the two are, are, are linked. I mentioned earlier that there's at least an argument that the United States could have avoided the colonization of the Western Hemisphere um, without kind of going to the interventionist extremes that it did. I think that argument essentially plays out like this, that the United States would have threatened war against any great power any time it thought that Europe was trying to come into the hemisphere, but that it wouldn't have taken an active interest in trying to nation build in its neighbors. And I think there's kind of a, a powerful story that can be told there about why that would have been actually the foreign policy that the United States should have followed. The risk, though was that every time you threaten war against a European great power, you might actually lead to a war with a European great power. And the United States, until World War I, didn't end up fighting uh, a, a war with a European great power. But there, there is at least a story you can tell in which the United States, by not sort of actively policing its own neighborhood, would have led to conflict between, uh, you know, let's say the United States and Germany in a way that would have been extraordinarily destructive for Americans. Uh, the United States almost certainly would have won that conflict in the long run, at least if its aims were limited to kind of the Western Hemisphere. But any war, of course, ends up becoming very bloody and kind of um, and, and costly uh, in, in both uh, blood and treasure in ways that I think uh, policymakers could could rationally think would sort of not be worth uh, the, 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 the other benefits of that policy, if that makes sense. So the point, I guess, is I, I don't have a a clean answer to your question, I think it does sort of end up being just different trade-offs and different risks. And ultimately, I think that's, you know, but that is what foreign policy ends up being. You know, how do you account for kind of risks that might be tiny, but could be, could have relatively existential consequences? Um, and there's not always an easy answer to that. Yeah. And is it possible that the U.S. could have just contented itself with being a rich country and not a great power? I imagine getting sucked into the Napoleonic Wars to some extent and other things has something to do with the U.S.'s ambition to be a great power on the world stage. Is there any particularly good reason? Well, one, do you think that's true? And two, do you think there's any particularly good reason why the U.S. should have or should now aspire to be that as opposed to just being a well-off country that's secure in its own territory? Yeah, I mean, so I, I think the sort of position you're articulating is sort of what might be called classical isolationism. And isolationism always gets a, a bad rap in the United States, uh, because I think it's always kind of misunderstood as sort of being, you know, the United States completely closing itself off from the rest of the world. When when in reality, the, the isolationist position is more, I think, limited to um, that the United States will always have trade and commerce with the rest of the world, but that politically speaking, it will not entangle itself in the kind of internal affairs of other nations. And there's a lot to be said for that, right? Because I think during most of American history, there really would have been relatively little consequence to such a policy. And in, in some ways, the United States was following that policy, at least vis-a-vis -vis Europe. The United States obviously was never very isolationist in the Western Hemisphere. Again, it, it's always a question of risks. But the problem with being a, a rich power, but not a great power, is that you have no means of militarily defending yourself. And if you are a rich power, there's always, of course, going to be a invitation to aggression by other powers who, let's say, are interested in, in whatever riches you may have amassed. And that was certainly concerned that the United States had during the particular 1870s and 1880s, where it had become quite prosperous, but its navy had simply fallen apart. And 
there was, um, and policymakers had this concern about, there's very little to stop a European great power from essentially just raiding our shores and sort of carting off whatever it wanted to. You know, I, I guess I would say that world history would have gone very, very differently, for instance, if the United States had not intervened in World War I, and particularly if it had not intervened in World War II. And the World War II, I guess, is a, is a good test of this theory, uh, because the argument uh, against the isolationist position is that if Nazi Germany ends up winning in Europe, or at least it consolidates, you know, it comes to sort of some sort of settlement with Russia or the Soviet Union, and it sort of consolidates control over the Western Hemisphere, or over Europe, the concern among senior policymakers, and particularly FDR, was that the next step uh, would be Nazi Germany essentially starting to make inroads into into the Western Hemisphere. And, and it's clear that there was at least interest in the Nazi leadership to do that. And eventually, you can sort of imagine a world in which the United States, you know, trades with everyone else. But the German kind of approach to the Nazi approach to trade was essentially to force countries into kind of one on one relationships and to sort of cut off their links with others. And so the United States might want to trade with the rest of Latin America. But if Germany is forcing all of Latin America to trade exclusively with Germany, suddenly all that trade falls apart. OK, maybe that's not so terrible for the United States. But then the Nazi Germany starts increasing its political influence in Latin America. And you end up in a world where, you know, very much down the road and very speculative, but you at least run the risk of the United States, you know, being uh, surrounded on all of its, on all sides by a power that has now become much stronger than it, and that has, you know, much more uh, resources at its command in a way that at that point, military defense becomes very, very difficult, if not impossible. And so the the chain of events there is sufficiently like long and spread out that it's very easy to sort of poke holes in that and say, well, this never would have happened because this, this, and this. I, I think it's more... The point, though, is that it's a balance of risks, and given that that is an existential risk, the the risks the the argument against the isolationist position ends up being that, like, yes, you might be right in you know fifty percent of the cases, seventy five percent of the cases, eighty percent of the cases, ninety percent, but in the uh, sliver of cases in which you are wrong, the consequences are so disastrous that, on balance, the policy ends up being unsupportable. I think ends up being sort of at a meta level, at least the response. Yeah, but I, I should I, say, you know, I mean, good. I, again, the, the the book, you know, as I point out, like, I mean, I the the interventions that the U.S. launched in this period, I am, you know, in the book quite. Uh, they were disasters at every single level, except the level in which they might have kept out European great powers. But certainly, in terms of what they managed to achieve, the U.S. record was not not very good at stabilizing its neighbors, bringing them prosperity, doing any of the things that the U.S. was ostensibly trying to do. I think your book would be very well read and enjoyed by a more interventionist or non-interventionist. You had a you had a, some glowing words by neoconservative Robert Kagan as well as John Mearsheimer. And John Mearsheimer is not a non-interventionist, but he's dramatically less interventionist than yes. Robert Kagan. So they both liked yes. your book a lot, and I think that's yes. that's great kudos to you. I was very pleased to get both of them. I think this may be the first time that uh, they have ever jointly blurbed a book because, as you said, they come at the issue from kind of very, very different poles. Yeah, I don't know what their personal relationship is like, but I, I, I've i only <laughs> ever heard them have fairly opposite foreign policy views. Yeah. Uh, would you say that this book essentially has, speaking of John Mearsheimer, essentially has a realist thesis about great power foreign policy and using the U.S. in this era kind of to make that case? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, I should, I guess, admit up front that John Mearsheimer was my BA advisor. And so I've certainly been influenced by, uh, you know, much of his thinking. Uh, I, I don't ag agree with Professor Ooh. Mearsheimer on uh, on many things. But in a lot of ways, I mean, he, his kind of classical book, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, is the story largely of Europe and Asia and sort of how the great powers there interacted with each other. And to the extent the United States figures in the story at all, it's in its in when it intervenes in World War One and World War Two and kind of the Cold War. And so my book, it's you know, it's not a, a theory book in the same way that um, Professor Mearsheimer's book is, but it is a history book that sort of I think fills in the gaps in that story and explains okay, that explains why the United States acted the way it did towards Europe, but what explains the way that the United States acted inside its own hemisphere. And I do think that great power competition still ends up being the engine that runs a lot of U.S. foreign policy in its hemisphere during this period. But one of the other kind of themes that uh, that I've sort of been hinting at during this interview and certainly in the book is that unfortunately, like the world of great power politics is often tragic, that even when people are acting rationally, even when they have the best of intentions, 
things end up going wrong, right? Thing, decisions are made that lead to bad consequences or decisions are made like in the knowledge that they will, will lead to bad consequences, but under the understanding that they are sort of last resort and that this is, you know, all things considered the only thing that a, a nation can do. And so one of the takeaways I sort of mentioned at the end of the book is, um, you know, with respect to China, there's always this debate about, well, is, you know, is China going to rise peacefully? Is it going to rise aggressively? And the argument that I make is it doesn't, much of the debate ends up being framed in terms of Xi Jinping or the Communist Party or communist ideology. And all of that is obviously quite relevant to the question of how China acts. There's no doubt, you know, nations are not black boxes or billiard balls on the table. You know, they have kind of internal politics that affect their, their foreign policies. But the point that I make is that even if China has relatively peacefully minded leaders, institutions, ideologies, culture, all that stuff, that doesn't necessarily mean that it won't act aggressively in certain situations. And so one of the things that I think I take away from Mearsheimer is that there are just unfortunately situations that occur quite regularly in international politics that lead nations to decide uh, rationally to use to use force in what they perceive as their self-defense. Do you want to say anything more specific about the kind of lessons you are drawing about China, uh, specific to modern concerns around Taiwan or whatever else? Yeah, so I'll, I'll highlight two. I mean, one is simply that it is almost unavoidable that China will try to repeat in East Asia what we successfully accomplished in the Western Hemisphere. In the Western Hemisphere, we eliminated or neutralized every other great power in the neighborhood, uh, leaving us as the sole great power of the Western Hemisphere or what political scientists call a regional hegemon. And it's an incredibly powerful position in international politics because it essentially means you're invulnerable. Um, if you are a great power in your neighborhood and there's no other great power there, there's just literally almost as a matter of definition, you are immune from the most kind of traditional threat in, in uh, politics. China of course, wants the same thing in the same way that, of course, every nation, if it could snap its fingers and be the only great power in its neighborhood, would want that, whether that's China or Monaco, right? But China has a very, a much more realistic chance of accomplishing that goal than Monaco just by virtue of its size, its military, and all that. The complication for China, of course, is that it's in a neighborhood where there are other well, at first, there's the there's another great power in the form of the United States present in East Asia. Uh, and then there are also a number of neighbors that, you know, you could call them great powers or at least quasi great, great powers. But um, Japan, India, Russia sort of come to mind as as neighbors of China that uh, prevent it from being from fee, from essentially being the only great power in its neighborhood. And so the Chinese challenge is how to figure out that problem in a huge part of the story for China. And I think the primary objective of its foreign policy, certainly since the early 1990s, has been to expel the United States from East Asia, for the obvious reason that the Chinese feel that they are going to be in a much safer position geopolitically if they don't have massive amounts of American military forces on their border. Not particularly surprising. So the first lesson of the book is that China, you know, at least at the broadest level, is probably going to uh, try and do the same thing as the United States uh, did. We already see echoes of the Monroe Doctrine in the way that Xi Jinping talks about security in Asia, where he basically says quite explicitly that, you know, the problems of Asia are to be solved by the people of Asia. And it's a not so veiled reference to, you know, the United States needs to leave and we need to essentially have a zone of the world in which the only uh, relevant uh, powers are the ones that are kind of resident in that neighborhood. But then the second point that I make in the conclusion is that Yes, people are very concerned about Taiwan, and for, for good reason, right? Just given Chinese claims to Taiwan, it is understandable why a conflict might develop there. Um, but in large part, because everyone is focused on it, you can imagine a world in which deterrence ends up holding pretty well because, you know, at least the United States and Taiwan itself have pretty strong incentives to kind of make sure that Taiwan can fend off any attack, and China's unlikely to attack Taiwan until it's relatively sure it can take it. The areas of uh, Asia that concern me more in terms of being a flashpoint for a potential conflict between China and the United States, are areas of Asia where you can imagine a power vacuum developing and China being concerned that the United States is going to fill that power vacuum in a way that ends up adversely impacting its security. And so this ends up being a very similar sort of dynamic to what the United States was dealing with in its own hemisphere. 
And I'll just give you a, an easy example, which is if North Korea collapses into anarchy tomorrow, right? I mean, the government just falls apart. There's little doubt that South Korea is going to try and unify the Korean peninsula. Uh, there's always been an understanding that the division between North and South Korea is artificial and that ultimately there should be one Korean nation state. It is equally obvious that China is not going to tolerate that. Uh, the Chinese do not want uh, Korea, uh, do not want South Korea to unify the peninsula because that will mean that there will be a U.S. military ally, uh, presumably still having its forces on Korean solar, soil, that is now right up to the border with China. And the Chinese, I think, in large part, would be willing to use military force to, to prevent that from happening in the same way that, incidentally, they did in the Korean-American War, where the Chinese uh, kind of didn't object when the United States went in and uh, defended South Korea against North Korea's invasion. But once the American forces crossed the border and started heading to started trying to unify Korea, that's the point at which China obviously entered into the conflict and pushed the American forces back uh, to the 38th parallel. And so, you know, I don't think that dynamic is fully resolved, right? I mean, and and I worry that there's less planning on for contingencies like that than there is for, you know, the more obvious uh, Taiwan contingency. So do you um, think that the U.S. Ha having uh, this clear military alliance with South Korea actually gives China an interest in maintaining the Kim regime? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I but I think it's, you know, the, the next step of the argument would be something like, well, if the United States uh, ended its uh, military alliance with South Korea, wouldn't that solve the problem? Which uh, that is, of course, a much trickier argument to make for a lot of reasons. But there's no doubt that, you know, that the Chinese support the uh, the Kim uh, dynasty in North Korea in large part as a counterbalance to the U.S. support of the South Koreans. Absolutely. Do you think in reality that China pursuing regional hegemony is actually in its security interest, or do you think it makes it less safe? It's an interesting question because the argument is, well, to step back, the many great powers have tried to make runs at regional hegemony. But once you start listing uh, the names of these great powers, you start to see what the problem is. So they, they are Napoleonic France, they are Imperial Germany uh, during World War I, they are Nazi Germany during World War II, and they are uh, Imperial Japan during World War II. And of course, that record is not a happy one, either for the nations in question or for the world at large. Every time, every time there is a great power that makes a run for regional hegemony, it usually leads to world war, and usually that power ends up losing and getting occupied at the end of it by hostile forces. So the United States, I mean, one of the kind of remarkable remarkable things about our story is that the United States really is the only power in modern history uh, that has successfully become a regional hegemon. And so the argument from that historical record is that it is irrational for China to pursue regional hegemony, uh, at least in a militarily offensive way, because the more likely result of that is that there will be a conflict in which China loses. And so isn't China better off by essentially not trying to to revise the status quo. And again, I think there's truth to that. And I think the Chinese probably at least to a certain extent understand that the historical record is not a happy one for, for people making aggressive or for countries making aggressive runs at regional hegemony. But I think that's a little bit different than the question of whether they want to pursue regional hegemony at all. Uh, again, from any nation's perspective, if you can become a regional, regional hege hegemon, so much the better. The question is just what means do you use? And I do think that the Chinese aren't necessarily at the state where they're looking to launch an offensive war that would give them that status. I don't think China's about to invade uh, Japan or just try and forcibly expel the United States uh, from East Asia quite yet. The Chinese will only do that if they feel like they can win and they think the odds of doing so are good. In the same way that Napoleonic France, Imperial Germany, not, uh, Imperial Germany is actually kind of an exception, but Napoleonic France, Nazi Germany, and Imperial Japan all sort of made the calculation that they could actually win this thing. Whether you know the Chinese accurately uh, sort of assess the the calculation and the the uh, cost benefit calculus, it's hard to say. But I think this is in large part why the U.S. strategy has been and continues to be deterrence, right? That to ensure that the U.S. military buildup in uh, East Asia and in particular its relationship with many of China's neighbors is such that China doesn't feel like it could get away with it, and that balance of power, while of course, leading to a lot of tension between all the states involved, at least is a stable equilibrium that prevents, you know, the sort of um, region-wide and potentially worldwide war that could result if China felt like it could uh, it could make that run. Do you have any recommendations for a book that you think would complement this book particularly well? 
I'll, it depends uh, which angle you want to come at it from. So, I mean, John Mearsheimer's Tragedy of Great Power Politics is, of course, a classic of realism that's always fun, but it is a more theoretical book. Um, for those who are interested in history, and particularly the history of U.S. foreign policy during this period, there's a couple of books that I would uh, recommend, I think. Uh, I think it's Warren Zimmerman's First Great Triumph does a relatively even-handed uh, account of the Spanish-American War and some of the lead-up and consequence of that. I would also recommend David Healy has a book called uh, Drive to Hegemony that also talks about this 20-year period and again does, I think, a relatively even-handed job of sort of assessing the kind of motivations and, and incentives of U.S. foreign policy during this period. Healy's book tends, is a little bit on the more scholarly side, though. Okay, I will include those on the show notes. Excellent. Do you have any upcoming projects you want to plug? At this point, my wife has forbidden me from ever writing a book again. This one took eight years. And so I am uh, mostly just uh, working on a few kind of projects related to uh, to the book. I think going forward, you know, as I mentioned before, what, what took me into this area to begin with is China. And I think that'll sort of continue being... Uh, the area of interest going forward. Uh, and of course, kind of always the question of, you know, how do we structure American foreign policy in a way that leads to the most peaceful outcomes, you know, on, on benefit, given sort of the the cataclysm of any potential conflict with China. And where can people find you if they want to keep up with your work? So much to my publisher's unhappiness, I have no uh, real social me public social media presence, uh, but I do have, uh, I'm a visiting scholar at the Hoover Institution. And so I have a page there with some of my um, some of my work kind of uh, linked there. Um, so I think that's probably the best place. Your happiness is more important than your publisher's happiness. And it's probably <laughs> added to by not being on social media. Well, that is, yeah, I, I, I wish I could say that this was a very deliberate sort of analysis of the corrupting effects of social media and, and blah, 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 blah. The, the truth is, I just sort of never got around to it in part because I was so busy with the book. So um, we'll see if that changes in the near future. But all right. Well, my guest today has been Sean Mirsky, and his book, once again, is We May Dominate the World, Ambition, Anxiety, and the Rise of the American Colossus. Sean, thank you so much for joining me on Ideas Having Sex. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for listening to Ideas Having Sex, where we have stimulating conversations on social science, philosophy, history, politics, and more. If you're a fan of what I do, please take a minute to subscribe to the show and to give us a rating and review wherever you listen. I'm Chris Kaufman. Thanks for listening.